band. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the craziest band in the land. Father Knickerbocker.
Mother Novia. Yeah. See now, now there you got a you got an example of uh, Chubby at a, uh, Chubby, Chubby making too much noise. Actually, it'd been better if he would have just stood there and, and, and waved his arms instead of yelling all the time. Uh, Tiny was just cooking all the way. I mean, you know, you notice all, all that motion coming and that great sound out of that bass drum. You know, I mean, that's yeah. that's so important. And, uh, and and the way he used it, I mean, it's constant motion. You know, I mean, uh, that, that, uh, and, and that chugger chugger. And then he had that rub a dub, what we you know, call a rub a dub feel. Right. Which uh, I use too, you know. I mean, that's that is really what makes a band move is that rub a dub. It's it, it's it's a shuffle, but uh, you can't shuffle. I mean, it's not a regular shuffle. It's it's a feeling. It's a feeling of a, of twelve, you know. Right. Diba 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 bum bum You know, it's it's what it's what makes a band move ahead and keeps everything inspired. And you don't have to get on top of the beat to do it. You just, he's just sitting back there, laying back, you know, and it's. Uh, it's beautiful sound. We got a call before, you know, Phil Brown, who replaced who replaced Tiny and Stan gets his group, who uh, uh, called before, and he reminded me of something that I didn't mention, and it's, he's right, because I have pictures of Tiny, and I remember when he said it, I said, I remember seeing Tiny playing that way. Tiny played the matched, what we call matched grip What's back that? in those days. What They didn't call it matched grip then. That didn't come on until much later on with it. Uh, with that particular thing, he was just holding the stick. Well, he held belt. He held both sticks, mm -hmm. uh, face down. We'll say with the wrists. When he played uh, with sticks, with brushes, of course, he played the traditional way, which uh, I can't explain on the air too much because you have to see it to know what I'm talking about. But uh, uh, I play traditional grip all the time, except when I play Latin. Then I go, or when I do Latin, then I go to uh, matched grip because that's what you usually have to do. You know. Uh, he played it all the time because of the size of his hands. See, I didn't know this. I mean, but uh, it's, it, I think it's interesting for the people to know Very that. Nice. I'm glad Phil called. If you're listening, Phil, thanks a lot, because it's a it's a wild thing. You you can actually hear it in the way he's playing. And I remember seeing him, but I just didn't remember that. But because of uh, the fat on his hands, I guess you could say, because he was, you know, that was fat. Uh, he couldn't uh, control the stick because the sticks he like I said before, he used a light stick. And with all that power is coming out of with light sticks, and he's not playing as loud as you think he is, because he's definitely not. It's it's that's still light playing, even though it's it's intense. Yeah. You know, his heaviest thing he's hitting is probably the bass drum. You know, and it sounds so good. Who cares? You know, it's it's such a beautiful leathery sound, which was what uh, you should get. That's why I, I I think all drummers, even if you play plastic heads, if you can, if you could have a uh, a, a calfskin head on your bass drum, what a fantastic sound you can get. You know, I mean, it's it, you cannot get that out of plastic. It sounds like leather, you know, because it is leather. That's what a head is, calfskin. It's skin, it's, it's skin yeah. and that's leather, you know. And with the right size beater and with hitting right in the middle, because there's that 20-inch bass drum again. That gets the, see, a 20-inch bass drum gets the best sound because the center of the drum most uh, foot pedals, uh, the height of the foot pedals, if you set your beater uh, where it's got the best balance, mm -hmm. that beater will hit right directly in the center of the drum. And that's where you get that, that sound. Yeah. See, if you're playing a larger bass drum, uh, the, uh, even, uh, the beater is going to hit off center, and you're going to get a, a boomier sound. You're not going to get that, that middle, to the, middle of the drum sound, which is uh, on a snare drum is very difficult to play in the center of the drum. Mm -hmm. Because there's it's, it's there's a feeling there of resistance. You most drummers, including myself, will play more towards the edges, 
uh, well, you get more ring also. But the dead center of the snare drum is dead. You know, I mean, there's no response. You get very little response there. But in a bass drum, yeah, that's where you get that heart, that that thud. Yeah. You know. Yeah. It's great, and uh, that's what you're hearing there. What you're hearing on the radio right now is Mel Lewis on the history of jazz drums. It's 2.33, and we just heard some air checks of Chubby Jackson's band live at the Royal Roost. In March 1949, we heard Tiny's Blues, Father Knickerbocker, and Lemon Drop. And Al Epstein was the tenor soloist, and uh, probably Marty Flax on the baritone, and uh, Normie Fay on the trumpet solos, Al Porcino on lead trumpet, Frankie Socolo on the alto sax, and uh, Gene Denovi on piano. Now, those were all Tiny's arrangements, yeah. uh, and in fact, originals in the whole works. Yeah. But we, I think, uh, well, I don't mean Lemon Drop, he didn't write, uh, that was George Wallington's right. uh, tune. But uh, uh, I think we should give credit to Al Cohn. A Al actually wrote the uh, the out chorus on Tiny's Blues. I mean, I don't okay. know. A lot of people don't realize that. Sure. And um, also, as you mentioned later, when he finally got some kind of, um, when he really was cooking, uh, was when Tiny Khan was with Elliot Lawrence's band, which really was taking off in the early 1950s. They made records. Unfortunately, I don't have them with me. Uh, so we we can't hear them, but the three arrangers were Al Cohn, Johnny Mandel, and Tiny, and Tiny Khan. Khan. So that shows you the company he was in and respected by those guys as a writer. So he was obviously also the the track he did for Charlie Barnett, which I didn't play because he does. There's no drumming on it to speak of. I have a tape of a uh, live broadcast of Elliot Lawrence. Really, at home? I'll yeah, I should have brought it. Uh, is uh, his beautiful arrangement of "Over the Rainbow," oh, which is yeah, uh, unlike for Charlie Barnett's else. band. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's 2.34. Let's hear some more Tiny Con. These are some very celebrated recordings done up in Storyville in Boston with Stan Getz Quintet. Mm -hmm. These were very, very big when they came out, I mean, among musicians and other mm -hmm. folks. Because of the rhythm section, Al Haig, Jimmy Rainey, Teddy Kotick, and Tiny Con. That's right. Along with Stan Getz, we'll hear uh, two tracks, Rubberneck and Parker 51, which is based on Cherokee. Anything you want to tell us to listen for? No, tiny. no, because I got to hear this. I haven't heard this myself in a long right. time. But uh, I was, you know, just listen. That's all. Okay.
the yeah, that was that was yeah. nice. Stan gets quintet at Storyville. We heard Parker Fifty One, which is Cherokee, and before that, Rubberneck with Jimmy Rainey, Teddy Kotick, Al Haig, Stan Getz, and on the drums, Tiny Con. Right, you hear that wonderful brushwork on it last time. You know, yeah. it was nice the way he went back. You know, he waited a break and then hit it. That's not easy to play t play that tempo with brushes. And, and Tiny used the wide brush. You know, of course, on on the calfskin hair, it had that wide sound so nice. Then he went up there to switch to the sticks and just floated all the way from then on. Yeah. Uh, now he could play up tempos, no problem at all, you know. But uh, I wish they would have done some fours or eights; would have been nice. Yeah. Just to hear what he would have done with solo. Yeah. Because we have we actually have not heard him solo at all today, and yeah. I don't think there's too much out on him not soloing. Not too much. Not too I much. don't recall. In fact, I don't think I have anything of him soloing. I don't think I've ever heard him solo on a record. I heard that Buddy Rich was crazy about him. Oh, everybody was, really, you know. Uh, because at the, he was he was a very refreshing... Of course, he was a f lot of fun to be around, too, you know. But he was a very refreshing drummer, you know. I mean, he he was he was in that same scene, you know, at, at the time when uh, when Max was coming up and Shelley and... Uh, and uh, Shadow, you know, I mean, these were all the New York drummers, Denzel Best, and, uh, you know, the road bands were out, all the big bands were out on the road right. and uh, playing dance music, and these guys were holding down the fort with the, with the small groups and the bebop groups in the, in, in the, in the middle to late 40s, and uh, that's what was happening, you know, so they were, like, all close to each other, you know, and, of course, when... When when bands when ba when the when the big band drummers would come to town, and the guys you go down to the Royal Rooster or or to uh, the, uh, out to the street, Fifty Second Street, and hear what's happening, right? You know, and hear these guys play. Yeah, and uh, it was sort of exciting for the guy on the road because uh, he he wasn't hearing much of that out there. I would there. imagine you come to New York and hear all this. Dude. Sure, yeah. this is a, something new happening all of a sudden. You know, and then how am I going to get into that? You know. Well, the best way would be to stay home, stay in New York, and start playing with small groups is really the only way you could do it. Yeah. That's why I'm thankful for myself that I got so much small group playing done uh, in, in those 40s, in, in the 40s. So by the time I started playing with big bands, you know, and then because when I went through that period of playing with dance bands from uh, 49 through 53, I mean, I couldn't. I had to go out and look for places to play all the time. And we were on the road, we were always looking for jam sessions. And if we couldn't find we created our own, because there was always bl good blowers in the band. And I was blessed with a few good bass players on the bands I played with. Uh, so we'd, we'd get to play, good rhythm sections anyway. Because most of the rhythm section players were always into, you know, and we hated the music we had to play on the road, you know. Yeah. But you had to make a living. And it was either that or do nothing. And uh, so by the time I joined the Kenton band, uh, I had all this, sm you know, I, I had my approach was there already, you know, sure. which was uh, very similar to, t to Tiny's in a lot of ways, you know. Yeah. But, uh, uh, which was wild that we, we were so much alike, you know, and in uh, and, and, and doing it. And, of course, by this time, he was gone. Yeah. So when I hit the Kenton band, I was like... Uh, when I came hit New York with the, with the Kenton band, all the critics, you know, they they were writing about me and that I made the band swing and that and I had a small group approach. You know, I think some of them had forgotten about Tiny and what he was doing. You know, because he had been already gone a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, no, not really. About a year. I think he died in fifty three. Fifty three, maybe fifty two. I'm not sure. Uh, but he was only twenty nine. I know that. Yeah. And uh, I felt bad. You know who told me? I was I was pla I was back in Buffalo. We were expecting our first child, uh, and and I was in Buffalo working in a nightclub, playing behind Sammy Davis, uh, with a, with a seven piece band, no bass, just piano and and uh, drums and uh, and five horns. You know, and uh, Woody's band had been playing over at the uh, at the uh, over in the. Crystal Beach in Canada, and and they finished, and I had friends in the band, and they knew, and they all they uh, Sam Staff, the baritone, uh, baritone player, player uh, he and a few other guys came to this club I was working in, and they told me that they said, by the way, some bad news today, you know. And I said, what? He says, Tiny Khan died, you know, and I had no idea. Well, mm. I felt terrible because we we were good friends.
Yeah. Because I know him, you know, he was also in Herbie Fields' group, the small group, and Georgie Ald's band. Yeah. That's what I have next to, to, to go out with with Tiny Con is a rare recording of him with Georgie Ald. Oh, great. A never ish, uh, reissued performance from January 24th, 1951, just a little before the Stan Getz recordings. We'll hear the new airmail special, and he's well recorded here. You can hear mm -hmm. the cymbals nice. Tiny Con with Georgie Ald. that then earlier you know we just had a phone call we're listening to tiny con with uh georgie ald and you mentioned it would be nice to hear him trade some fours with stan getz and stuff on some of those records so a yeah. uh, sac great saxophone player named gary keller just called up yeah, to say gary. that on uh, mosquito knees yeah he trades with stan getz uh-huh so we fade that down and i'll find mosquito knees and we'll play it so we can have an example before the show ends which is going to be any minute now of tiny con trading fours okay. with stan getz so thanks for the call Ah, uh, mosquito knees. Okay, here it is. We don't have time to hear the whole track. Uh, yes, we do. So here it is. Thank you. 
with Tiny Khan, Al Haig, and Teddy Kotick, and Jimmy Rainey. Ah, we got really? to hear some fours. Yeah, we got to hear some fours, because uh, I don't think he did very many on too many records. And uh, I know he did a lot in person, but, you know, we're, we're dealing with records here today. Yeah. Very nice, very clean. Crisp, yeah, it was good. Crisp. I mean, you know, it was crisp and clean. And, uh, in fact, that was the tightest sound, uh, you know, uh, of course, he was up in Storyville, and, and that was—I I had been in there a couple of times, and it, it was one of those little small dead places, you know. It was a very po popular club in Boston. George Wino, uh, it was George Wino. But Wiener. the bass drum still had that good thump to it, you know. Yeah. And uh, that didn't change. But then again, see, we're dealing—again, you're dealing with calfskin heads. So if there was air conditioning on in the room, or if the room, or if it was dry that day. Uh, the drummer doesn't have as much control over how, how his heads are going to be. They might be on the dry side, which means they'll be a little tighter and crisper even than plastic. And that's what that sounds like to me, you know. Yeah. But, uh, and you can't really loosen them because they just get tight again, you know. That's the way it is. Yeah. And when it's damp, you tighten them up and uh, they get damp, they get loose again. Yeah. But I'll tell you, you can't be, uh, like I said before, you can't beat the feel of skin and you can't beat the, the sound they get when they're right, you know. We're talking with Mel Lewis, Lauren Schoenberg here. We're going to sign out. We'll see you next Tuesday afternoon at noon with part seven of the history of jazz drums. We'll get into Roy Haynes, as promised, and Louis Belson. Mm -hmm. So that'll be a fun show. And uh, stay tuned for afternoon music here on WKCR-FM in New York, 89.9 on your FM dial. On behalf of Mel Lewis, this is Lauren Schoenberg signing out. Have a good week, everyone. See you next Tuesday.